Can you guys hear me well? Do I need to talk louder? Thumbs up if I need to talk louder. Good, louder, got it. So I'll try to do my best. If I ever get too low, just shout at me and I will try to speak as loud as I can. So we're gonna start off with a word of prayer. So would you join with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have to just study your word. And Father, we really wanna understand what you have communicated us so many years ago. And as we open up the book of Daniel, Father, we, for many of us, for myself included, I've had so many questions that seem like a mystery. And Father, we desperately need your spirit to illuminate our eyes, to give us insight, and to give us wisdom. So we ask tonight, Father God, that you would do that for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And so I want to appreciate your guys' time. We're going to try to be done within an hour. So it's 7.02. If I go a little bit beyond, you can just get up and leave, okay? So I'm going to try my best to be respectful for your time. And so um, as we get into the book of Daniel, um, about two and a half years ago, I began a journey where a lot of the Old Testament, when I was in Bible college, a lot of the emphasis and focus that we were taught was the New Testament. And when I was there, it was all about Jesus. The Old Testament it was just waiting for Jesus to come. And now that Jesus has come, it's all about the New Testament. And, it's, and the Old Testament was like, yeah, it's here, but it's in this weird place. It happened with laws. And there was all these things where there wasn't this grace and mercy. But the New Testament is all about grace. It's all about mercy. So immerse yourself in all the things of of the New Testament and things of Jesus. In the Old Testament, it's there, but we really don't know what to do with it. And anybody else felt like that at any point in time? Yeah. So two and a half years ago, I began on a journey with a friend of mine, my old roommate college from college way back in the day. And he set me on a journey that when New Testament writers refer to the Old Testament, they have this understanding that we know the whole story of why they referenced it. So when they mention a new, an Old Testament passage, they're expecting us to know the stories of the Old Testament. So when they quote it, oh wow, this makes sense because I know the context, I know the narratives, and I know the stories. Well, for me, I've known that over the many, many years of being a Christian, at churches, I, there hasn't been a good job of people filling in those gaps with stories. And a lot of it falls because we as pastors were not trained to understand completely the Old Testament and how it fits. So I began this journey where I said, you know what, I'm going to go back to the Old Testament. And my goal is to figure out how the Old Testament shines insight into the New and how the New Testament uses what was given in the Old Testament. And so for those of you that just came in, it's perfectly awesome, it's cool. But on the table over there, if you want to go grab, there's a notepad, there's a pen, and there's a handout that we're going to refer to. So if you can head over there, grab some of those. It's for you. You get to keep them. You don't have to give them back. And they're yours for the rest of your life. Okay? So I say all that to say that when we dive into today's text, we're really going to set up the background of Daniel. We're going to set back, and there's going to be some time where we're going to spend time in the Bible. So it's not going to be just a time of listening to me. We're going to unpack some of this story, the overall narrative, because when the writers are writing, they're keeping in mind the scriptures that came before. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, as the later writers and prophets and wisdom writers came in, they were thinking of the Old Testament as a whole. And when they wrote, God was inspiring them, but they were also keeping that narrative ever before their minds saying this is how God operated at the beginning and this is how God is moving now. And so when we dive in tonight, we're going to see, we're going to do some background and dive in, but you're going to see that it's all going to tie everything together and it's going to make sense. And so my goal tonight is to do two things, to give a background of Daniel, to unpack that, and then also get through chapter one. So y'all with me on that? So you're going to have to put a, your seatbelt on because we're going to be going through a lot. We're going to be diving in. Tonight's going to be uh, way deeper than anything we could do on a Sunday morning. But it's been a blessing to me, and I hope it's a blessing to you as well. And so a lot of what I share about today is things that I've come through study over the years, but also from some significant scholars that I love. And so there's scholars like John Salheimer, N.T. Wright, Gordon Fee, and Douglas Stewart, and there's a few others. So a lot of the things I mentioned today are things that they've given insight into to me as well. So here we go. We're diving in right now. Good morning. Um, not good morning. Well, where am I? So grab a pen, grab a pad, grab a paper. They're all yours to keep forever. So when we look at the actual structure of the book of Daniel, Daniel is a puzzling book. 
It is one that has confused many Christians. It's one that has more questions than it does answers. And it's listed in the English Bible with the minor prophets. It's among the prophets. You have wisdom books, Proverbs, Psalms, um, Song of Solomon, and then you get into Isaiah, all these prophets. And English puts it there. But it's really not a soul prophet book. It's really not set up. It's kind of written like a collection of books all within one book. And so it doesn't really necessarily fit completely as a prophet book, but it's there in the English translation. The Hebrew Bible puts the book of Daniel after Esther and right before Ezra. And if you remember Esther, Esther was living in a kingdom that was not her own, and her people were about to be destroyed, and she stands before the king and intercedes on their behalf, and her people are saved. Very similar story here that happens with Daniel. Daniel and, his, and all of Israel are living in exile. He stands before the king. He interprets visions and dreams, and the people of Israel are saved. They're even able to go back out of exile eventually. And so we have a puzzling book that's ever before us. And so who wrote the book of Daniel? Well, here's a great answer for you. Not 100% sure. So on the idea of who actually wrote it, there are some that will say Daniel. Jesus refers to it in Matthew 24, 15. He makes a statement, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And so Jesus refers to Daniel the prophet. Now does he call him the writer? No, but there seems to be. Other, other scholars and other people will say, you know what, it's a collection of writers. It's somebody else, maybe it's a multiple of people who put this book together and this is what we have now. And others will say, you know what, we're not really sure, but we know that it was inspired by God. And so how do we answer who wrote Daniel? To me, I would think it was Daniel. But again, there's not a wrong answer here because we know every book of the Bible was inspired by God and ultimately it was not made up in man's mind. It was not myth. It's not a mystery. It is God's very words. So at the end of the day, we know God is truly the author behind the book of Daniel, even though we can't for sure say who it was that's the author. So when was this book written? This book was written, this is not in question, it was written in the 6th century, so the 600 B.C. So that's when this setting is taking place. So a little bit about that. We're going in now to what is actually, how is the book structured? And this is where it gets interesting because chapters 1 through 2, verse 3, is all written in Hebrew. Then when you get to chapter 2, verse 4, all the way through the end of chapter 7, it is written in Aramaic, which was the language of the Babylonians. Okay, and this is where you get the stories of Daniel and the lions then, the fiery furnace. This is where you get King Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and you get all these stories about the Babylonian culture and how it's the pride and all these things. And that's written all in Aramaic. Then the last few chapters, chapters 8 through 12, are then written in Hebrew. You might sit back and say, well, why is it done that way? Why was the book structured Hebrew, Aramaic, and Hebrew? We're not real sure, but some scholars have said it could be because the first part deals with Israel being in exile, the people of God. Hey, people of God, this is for you. Then the Aramaic part is, hey, this is a message that is for everybody, for the entire world to read and to understand. This is how God can work in your life. King Nebuchadnezzar showed pride, right? But then he humbled himself, and God humbled him and called out to God and said, he is the living God. He is the true God. And so Aramaic is, this is for everyone. And then the last chapters, 8 through 12, could be seen as referring to the Hebrew people again, the people of God saying, this message is for you. One day, I will ultimately bring you out of exile, and you will never return to exile ever again. And so some will say, this is why it's set up this way. Others will say, hey, the Aramaic part is there because this was the Babylonian culture in which the writer of Daniel was immersed in. It was the language of the day. Yes, they were Jews and they spoke Hebrew, but they were immersed in a culture that spoke Aramaic, and this is why this part is written in Aramaic, is because it's representing this Babylonian culture. And so Gordon Fee, who wrote a book, How to Read the Bible, book by book, which is a great book. If you haven't read it, I would suggest you to read it. But it points out that the book of Daniel, and on your handout, you're going to see there's this word that says Daniel was written in a chiastic pattern. And even in the Aramaic portion of the Bible, you can see what a chiastic pattern. Now, how many of you know what a chiastic pattern is already? Okay, well, great. That's fine. So here's what, here's what it is. There's a, it's a literary 
form of writing where you work through a story, a narrative, where you have A, then B, then C. Then the rest of the story goes C, then B, then A. You with me? So A happens, B happens, C happens. Then we start with C happens, B happens, and A happens. Now, you might be very confused, but look at the paper I gave you, okay? You're going to see this unfold in the book of Daniel. It starts out in the book of Daniel, exile to the unclean realm of the dead. So Israel goes to Babylon. They're in the land of the dead. They're exiled. They're kicked out of their land. They're now living in the east, which always represents the land of the dead, which always represents exile, and they're there. Then you have four kingdoms followed by the kingdom of God, A, then B, right? Then we get to three, deliverance of the trusting from the fiery furnace. We get C here. And the last part is C is coupled with that is the humbling of the proud king Nebuchadnezzar. Now we follow the pattern. What's the last thing in that first one, which was the humbling of king Nebuchadnezzar? The last part in this Kaiser pattern is, oh, so we're going to start with the humbling of proud king Belshazzar. Then we're going to get into the deliverance of the trusting from the lion's den, then we get into the four kingdoms followed by the kingdom of God. And then lastly, the end of the book ends with a return from exile and there is a resurrection from the dead. You follow that? So you see that? This is how, this is a structure of how the book of Daniel is put together. And this is how the different chapters and different sections work together. Now you might say, Brad, why is all this important? Why are you talking about all this? Because it's helpful to know how a book was put together in order to understand how to read it. I'm going to interpret a poem way different than if I'm going to interpret a newspaper article. Poems have metaphors. Poems have allegories. If it says Brad was like a monkey, was Brad really a monkey? No, but if it said, hey, in a newspaper, this monkey named Brad hit somebody with a banana, we're going to know Brad was really a monkey based upon the kind of, of, of article or piece of writing that we're looking at. And so it's important to know the structure so we know how to exegete it properly or to understand the text properly in its own context, in its own form. And so if you look at the Aramaic po portions of Daniel, which is 2, 4 through chapter 7, 2 and 7 have parallel stories. If you look at them, they contain similar visions of the future kingdom. They have ending with God's final eternal kingdom that will never pass away. Those two chapters are similar, different dreams, but same resolution is there. Chapters 3 and 6, you have the miraculous deliverance of God's faithful people. You have the fiery furnace, people who refuse to bow. Then you have the story of the lion's den, Daniel, who refuses to bow. And God immediate, not immediately, but God delivers them in a miraculous, powerful way. Then you have 4 and 5, where these two stories are about a king who was full of pride, who chose not to humble himself, and then those kings were humbled, and then both of those kings end up at the end of their humbling, expressing that Israel's God is great, Israel's God is the true living God, and Israel's God is the one who is truly in control of the world and the universe. And so when we look at this structure, it's important. It helps us see things in a new light in the book of Daniel. But Daniel is also, when it comes to the genres, I remember I told you it's like a collection of books. It doesn't really fit with prophets because there's different kinds of writings within there. There's these, um, one of the genres is a heroic tale. And in a heroic tale, this is a story of faithful people of God who are facing martyrdom because somebody in authority has told them, bow down to this other king, bow down to this statue, bow down to this image, or you will perish, or you will die. But then we see God do a miraculous deliverance in their life, and instead of dying, they're set free, they're elevated, they're exalted to a place of stature, to a place of favor, and then we see that because of their faith in God, God elevated them and God rescued them. The second kind of genre that's within the book of Daniel is wisdom. And when you look in scripture, have you guys ever heard this phrase that wisdom refers to God, like a capital W, that wisdom is seen as God and God is wisdom and he's the personification of wisdom. Anybody heard that in here? It's part of it in Daniel, Wisdom is also seen as the human king, King Solomon, who was the wisest king in all the universe, right? But it wasn't because of who Solomon was. It was because God gave him that wisdom. But in Daniel, the wisdom that we see is not a wisdom that originates within man. It is a wisdom that comes from the true God in heaven. And if you remember the story of Joseph back in Genesis, 
Joseph goes into, he's thrown into prison, he interprets dreams, he tells Pharaoh the dreams, what this all means, he has his own dreams, and who gives him the interpretation of it? God gives him the interpretation of it. So in the book of Daniel, we're going to see this is also a piece of writing that's included in there, where there's wisdom in the sense that Daniel has all insight into visions and dreams, not because he's smart, not because he earned it, not because he worked for it, but he has this wisdom because the living God has given him the wisdom that he needs to speak life into the Babylonian kings and into his own people. Then we go from wisdom books to martyrdom. And this is where you see towards the end of the book of Daniel, where Daniel and his friends, they're spared from the king's wrath. God rescues them. But when you look at the visions that, God, that Daniel has from chapter 7 through chapter 12, you see that there are kingdoms that come, evil, wicked kings that try to show the world they're in charge, and the saints of the Most High are killed. They're crushing the people of God. They're crushing the faithful of God. And so not everybody gets to get out of free of this martyrdom. There are faithful people of God who are killed by these evil empires. And this martyrdom is also a part of this writing that's included in Daniel. And then we get to this last kind, which causes the most confusion in the Christian world, and that is called apocalypses. Anybody heard of apocalypses? In other words, the apocalypse, apocalyptic writing. And what does apocalypses mean? It literally means revealing. And the whole idea behind apocalypses is this, is that God has a plan, and God's plans, the secret things belong to the Lord, right? And so in order for us to know God's will, in order for us to know God's plan, what does he have to do? He has to reveal it to us, okay? And how does he reveal it to his people? Dreams? Visions? How did he reveal it to Belshazzar? This is like a pop quiz. Writings, right? He wrote on the wall to writings for different people. And then he tells whoever he's telling the interpretation of, whoever he's revealing to, he tells them this, either write it down and share it. Go and speak this. Go and tell the people what I have told you. And here's what happens. The faithful people of God are given the responsibility by God to interpret the things that he's revealing so we can know what he's doing in the world. That this challenges the idea of many religions that think God is distant from the world. That there might be a God out there, but he doesn't really care about the universe because if he did, why is there evil in the world? That this God somehow, he started the world, he did a good thing, he created it, but he could care less what happens in your life. But that's not the God of scripture. The God of scripture shows us that he is a God who reveals himself to us. But he reveals himself to us at his time and to who he chooses to reveal himself. And the wrestling of mankind and the wrestling of me and the wrestling of you is we want God to reveal everything to us in our time, in our ways. And if God doesn't, then we take it upon ourselves to reveal the hidden things of God. And that's when we get into sin, we get into disaster, and we get into pride, thinking that our life is based upon our effort, our work, our striving, our struggle, instead of realizing our life is founded and built upon God and what he's doing in the world, not what I am doing in the world. And so behind all of this, behind all the genres, behind the setting, behind the patterns that we see within the book of Daniel, there is a sub-narrative of Daniel that is constantly being presented before us. And the sub-narrative is this, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of the world. There's the sub-narrative. Everything that you see, it's a clash, a battle between the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of man. And every time the kingdom of man thinks that they are almighty, think that they are powerful, and think they know better than God. And so as you read the book of Daniel, and I would encourage you, read through with this sub-narrative in your mind and watch what you'll pick up. Watch where you'll see connections that you didn't see before. Where Wow, this is a complete slap in the face of God. When you read what King Nebuchadnezzar says, it's a, like this, I'm in charge, I'm dominant, I'm the greatest. And God laughs from heaven <laughs> like, you only have the power you have because I put you there. And so you see this narrative out. Egypt, Syria, and Rome, they all look like they're in charge, 
They're not. We look at today's world, no one is in charge but God. Some of these leaders do. They think they're ruling the world. They think they have it all figured out. No, God's in control of it, of it all. He has it all working according to his perfect plan, his perfect will. And then the other sub-narrative that we have in here is this. If God's people hold fast during exile, they will see God's vindication, they will see his salvation, and they will see his rescue. And so think about that. What does that mean for us as the faithful people of God today? We're living in exile in a society that's against God. Yeah, they might say you have the religious freedom in our country to worship God, but when you look at the way the world operates, it's in opposition to God. And we wrestle with that. We struggle with that. There's attacks on religion. I mean, attacks on all religions, actually. Judaism has faced since around Christmas time up to now. There's people getting attacked. I saw the other day a 13-year-old Jewish boy got punched in the face as a hate crime. So, I mean, it's people hate God, people hate religion, and what do we do when we're struggling in life? What do we do when we're being persecuted? What do we do when our faith is being tested? What do we do when the pressures of society are pushing on us to act differently, when they're pressuring us to compromise, when they're pressuring us, yeah, but does God really say that? Does God really mean what he says here? The book of Daniel teaches us that if the faithful people of God hold fast and we don't let go of God we don't compromise our faith in God that we will see his salvation his vindication and his rescue and even if we don't right fiery furnace just a preview our God we know he can spare us but if he doesn't we will never bow down to your gods and what are they saying we're holding fast to God no matter what you do to us that he is faithful and we're trusting in him and only him. And so this book is written to a people who are living in exile, who are living in a place without hope, or maybe their hope is there, but their hope is waning because God, if you're good, why is your people stuck in this evil, wicked kingdom? Why are we being mistreated? Why don't we have all the promises that you promised us so long ago? So keep this sub-narrative in mind because it's going to be seen all throughout the book of Daniel. Then Daniel chapter 7 is one of the most famous chapters in Daniel 7, which is called the Son of Man. You guys heard that terminology, the Son of Man? And so this is where we have the big, big theme of who is the Son of Man. And when you look at Daniel chapter 7, it tells us that the Ancient of Days gives to the Son of Man three things. Gives him the kingdom, gives him the dominion, and gives him the power. Now, who do we know to be the son of man today? Jesus, okay? We know that now, but think about it. You're living in exile. You don't know what you don't know. Where's the son of man coming? Where is he going to come and give us his kingdom and give us his dominion and give us his power? This is a huge topic, a huge theme in the book of Daniel, and we're going to unpack that later as we go on, but we're going to have to reference it throughout as we go through. And here's the big question in Daniel. You can write this down. Here's the big question that Daniel answers as you go, as we go through, we go study it and we look at it. When will exile end? It's a two-part question. Actually, I should have said big questions in Daniel. When will exile end? And when is God going to do what he said in Deuteronomy? I'll say it again. When will exile end? And when is God going to do what he said in Deuteronomy? So if you if you just came here, I have a notepad and handouts and pens on that table. If you want to grab it, it's yours to keep. You don't have to give it back. Right there on this table over here, you can grab a pen. That way you can take notes and all of that. Does anybody know the answer to the question? But this is where the whole book of Daniel is moving towards. It's, gonna, it's trying to answer the question, when will God's people be vindicated? 
When will they be rescued? When will the time come where all the promises will be fulfilled? And so, as we dive in, final notes as we go to the background of this book is, even today, the book of Daniel speaks to us as Christians. It is a, it's a story of people who give us hope, who give us encouragement that we can face trials and persecutions in our life and still find ways to be faithful to God. When we look at the book of Daniel, Jesus made Daniel a theme in his teachings. If you go back to his parables, a lot of his parables he spoke in apocalyptic, um, apocalyptic imagery or writings. One of them in particular is, the, you remember guys, remember the parable of the sower, where the sower goes out and he plants seeds and some fall, falls on the rock, others fall here, and some of them that bears a, it bears a tree. And his disciples are like, what are you talking about? Like, you're talking about seeds and things growing and not growing, and some starts to grow, and then it dies, and it withers, and then birds eat it. Like, what does all this mean? Well, in apocalyptic kind of writings, you have this, here's what's happening, here's a vision and dream. People are confused, right? In the book of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. Hey, what does this mean? Daniel comes up and explains it. Well, Jesus does the same thing to his disciples. Here's what it means. When the gospel goes forth, some people aren't going to receive it. It's not going to go anywhere. Some are going to receive it for a short time. It looks like they got it, but then as soon as the troubles of this world come, they're gone, they're done with God, they're done with Jesus because it never really sunk in. But for those where it falls on good, fertile ground, those people are going to grow. They're going to be a huge tree. There's going to be fruit everywhere. And Jesus explains it to them. Say, look, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the gospel of me going forth into the world and how people will respond. Some will reject it. Some will be with it for a minute. But once I challenge them to give up their own life and truly follow me, they're going to walk away. And others are going to truly get it. And for those who get it, guess what? They inherit the kingdom of God and they become the people of God. And so Jesus falls upon this theme of the Son of Man. He falls on the theme of apocalyptic writing. And Daniel chapter 7 is referred to by Jesus. It's referred to by all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Apostle Paul refers to the Son of Man. And the Son of Man is also mentioned in the book of Revelation. And it's, why is that important? Because the Son of Man ties into the answer of the question, when will the exile end? When will God do what he has promised to do in Deuteronomy. How has he done that? Through the Son of Man. And so before we dive into Daniel chapter 1, there's a couple quotes that are on the handout um, that I gave to you. And I want to look at these because these are, these are two quotes that are important as we dive in. In Daniel, this is by Dr. John Salheimer. He uh, was a former professor at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He passed away a few years ago. But this is what he says, in Daniel, the work of God is seen on a global scale. Not only did God rescue his people through their courageous faith, he also promised to rescue and vindicate his people in an ultimate way and on a cosmic scale in the days of the Messiah. And so what we see happening in the book of Daniel is God's plan, not just for Israel, God's plan for the entire world, the whole cosmos, people, world, creation, all of it is what Daniel is trying to show us how God is going to act and how God's going to move in this world to bring everything out of exile back from resurrection into the life that he has promised us. And as we dive in, I'm going to say one thing. Um, when we look at the book of Daniel, there's a lot of different ways you can approach Daniel. There's a lot of different systems in which you can view Daniel. And so some will take different views of eschatology, which means how do the last things work? How do the last days? And some people have different views on how that works out, different systems, dispensational, non-dispensational, all these things. And so here's what I'm going to do. I, I found it has been fruitful in my life and other people's lives that put systems aside put presuppositions aside and approach the text in this way where we look at the text and figure out what is the author saying what does it mean to him what does it mean to the audience who heard it and then what does it mean to us and not go beyond what the text says so the purpose of this study the next four weeks I'm not going to tell you a system because systems are good there's a place for systems systems are great but in this scenario we're going to try to stick to the text and what the text says, 
and what it's speaking to us. Does that make sense? Okay, so here the author says it way better than I do. So I'm just going to read what he says and shut up, okay? He says, we will interpret the various visions of Daniel and the Babylonian kings always and only as they are interpreted within the book itself. It is always tempting to try to second guess what this or that vision may signify. That is all well and good, but in the last analysis, we must pay most attention to the interpretations provided within the text themselves. Anybody confused there yet? Tell me now. I don't want to move on if you're confused. You with me? Okay. And where there are none, to refrain from straying too far in our own suppositions. So the goal of this is to stay within the text, and where the text is, we can't go any further in the text, not to get too far and carried away, because many people will say, this is how it is, and this is the only way it can be, and if you don't believe this, you don't believe the Bible. And it's like, well, no, that's not true. Let's, let's stick to what the point of the book is trying to teach us, because you can get off into rabbit trails that don't have anything to do with the text you're looking at. And this is, in, this is for any book of the Bible. This is important for any of it. Stick to what the text is saying. Don't go too far, and also not to bring our own ideas of the world in 2020 into a text that was written thousands of years ago with people who had a way different mindset, a way different view of the world than we do in our Western world. And the tendency that we have is to take words we see in the English Bible and give our own modern interpretation of it and think they thought exactly like we do. They don't. It was different. In some ways they did, in a lot of ways they don't. Especially being a Jewish culture, a Jewish worldview, a Jewish mindset, that at some point we have to figure out where their mind is so we can understand how they received it, so we know how to interpret it. So we're going to dive right in, okay? And I want you to, if you have your Bible or you have it on your phone, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 27. And so this is important, and um, I told you at the beginning that we're going to dive into a lot of the Bible because it's necessary to understand what came before, to understand what is presented right before our face. And so Deuteronomy chapter 27 this, these chapters here stand behind the text of Daniel. It stands behind the purpose of the book. It stands behind what has happened. It explains how we get to Daniel. How did the Jewish people end up in exile? Deuteronomy 27 through 30 is the way to find that answer, okay? So I'm going to explain a little bit of chapter 27. I'm not going to read chapter 27, but I want to read through chapter 28, and through chapter 30. 29 we're not going to do, but you could read all of those chapters later. But um, God has called his people, and he's getting ready to tell them, look, here's what's going to happen. You're my people. Got you out of exile. Here's what I want to do for you. I want you to put some people on Mount Gerizim, and these people on Mount Gerizim, they're going to give blessings to the people of Israel. They're going to tell you, man, if you follow God, if you're faithful to him, here's what's going to happen. But he said, I want you also to put some people of the tribes of Israel on Mount Ebal. And on Mount Ebal, we're going to share the curses where if you don't follow God, here's what God's going to do. And so there was this challenge like of, hey, there's Mount Gerizim with blessings. There's the Mount Ebal with cursings. The writer says, I, therefore, I tell you to choose life. Choose the way of blessing. Don't choose the way of cursing. Because if you choose the way of cursing, then God has to do what he said he's going to do. So look at chapter 28. And here's what the writer says. If you're blessings for obedience. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field. Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb, and the fruit of your ground, and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds, and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake, and he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God has given you. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself as he has sworn to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God 
and walk in his ways. And all the peoples of the earth shall see to you, shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. And the Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your livestock and in the fruit of your ground within the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hands. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. And the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you shall only go up and not down. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, being careful to do them. And if you do not turn aside from any of the words that I command you today, to the right hand or to the left, to go after other gods to serve them. Now, how many of you are like, man, that's awesome. That's the life that I want to live, right? Yep, we all strive for that. But we as people, we fail, right? We fail. And look at what he says. Now, here's the cursings. But if you don't, here's what happens. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall be you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and frustration, and all that you undertake to do until you are destroyed and perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds, because you have forsaken me. The Lord will make the pestilence stick to you until he has consumed you off the land that you are entering to take possession of it. The Lord will strike you with waste and disease and with fever, inflammation and fiery heat and with drought and with blight and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish and the heavens over your head shall be bronze and the earth under you shall be iron. The Lord will make the rain of your land powder. From heaven dust shall come down on you until you are destroyed. Yikes. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them. You see this chiastic pattern here, right? And you shall be a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth, and your dead body shall be food for all the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth, and there shall be no one to frighten them away. The Lord will strike you with the boils of Egypt, with tumors and scabs and itch of which you cannot be healed. The Lord will strike you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind, and you shall grope at noonday as the blind gropes in darkness, and you shall not prosper in your ways. And you shall be only oppressed and robbed continually, and there shall be no one to help you. You shall betroth the wife, but another man shall ravish her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You will shall plant a vineyard, but you shall not enjoy its fruit. Your ox shall be slaughtered before your eyes, but you shall not eat any of it. Your donkey shall be seized before your face but you shall not be restored to you. Your sheep shall be given to your enemies, but there shall be no one to help you. Your sons and your daughters shall be given to another people while your eyes look on and fail with longing for them all day long, but you shall be helpless. A nation that you have not known shall eat up the fruit of your ground and of all your labors, and you shall be only oppressed and crushed continually so that you are driven mad by the sights that your eyes see. The Lord will strike you on the knees and on the legs with grievous boils of which you cannot be healed from the sole of your foot to the crown of your head. The Lord will bring you and your king whom you set over you to a nation that neither you nor your fathers have known and there you shall serve other gods of wood and stone and you shall become a horror, a proverb and a byword among all the peoples where the Lord will lead you away. Okay, skip to chapter 30. So I wanted to stop there in chapter 28. Why? Because it leads us to one of the things that God will do when the people disobey is they're going to be exiled to another nation. That that is always the case. Israel follows God. They're in the land. They're where God wants them to be. There's land flowing of milk and honey. Everything is going great. Then this king who follows God, he dies. The next king comes up, does what is evil in the sight of his own eyes. He falls into sin. The people of Israel fall into sin. They forget their God. And what does God do? Boom, you get taken over by another nation. Now you're serving other kings. You're serving other gods. And all these disastrous things from Deuteronomy chapter 28 fall upon 
God's people, and they're living in exile, they're living in misery because they chose the cursings and they didn't choose the blessings. And this is how God operates. And so then we get to verse 30 because when, when there's exile, with God, what is there always also as well? What's that? Refuge, yep. But when there's an exile with God, there's always a return from exile, right? And in Scripture, that return is referred to as resurrection. And so all throughout Scripture, you have exile and you have resurrection. You have Adam and Eve, okay? They sinned. What did God do? Kicked them east. Kicked them out of exile. I mean, kicked them out of the garden, kicked them into exile, which is always referred to. Whenever you see east, that means exile. If somebody goes east, they're walking away from God, and they're walking in exile. But then when they're brought back, there's a return. It's resurrection. Think of Jesus, the picture of resurrection. Jesus is born, right? Born in Jerusalem. Then this bad king wants to kill Jesus. And where does God tell Joseph and Mary to go? To go to Egypt. Jesus goes to Egypt, which is east, goes into exile, and when the time was up, when it was safe for him, what does he do? Comes back. It's the idea of exile, resurrection. Exile, resurrection. And what does Jesus do on the cross? The greatest exile and resurrection of all time. Once and for all, resurrection. And so this idea stands behind it all. But look at chapter 30, and we'll read some of this. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If you are outcasts or in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your heart offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hand and the fruit of your womb and in the fruit of your cattle and in the fruit of your ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in your fathers when you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that are written in the book of the law. When you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And jump down to verse 19. And he says, and I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob to give them. And so this is the beautiful gospel way back in Deuteronomy. And like I alluded to before, so many people, it's the Old Testament is all about law. No, it's not. The Old Testament was about faith and love for God and God's grace and mercy given to his people who are faithful to him. And Jesus tells us the same thing today. God says the same thing to us. Look, there's two ways of life. One path leads to cursing, leads to death. One path leads to blessing and to life. This is the same message that we present to the lost world today. And the writer here says, therefore, choose. Like, I could hear Moses, like, begging, like, do this. Don't miss it. Get on the boat for what God is doing. Follow him with all your heart. Love him. And so this, these four chapters stand behind the book of Daniel. And we got to keep this in mind that if Israel obeys, where do they live? In the land that God promised them. If they don't, where do they live? In exile. So, Daniel chapter 1. Turn there. Here's 
here's where we get verse 1, as soon as I turn to it. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came and besieged it. Okay? So what just happened to Israel right there in the very first verse? Exile! So, happened to King Jehoiakim. So what did we think happened to King Jehoiakim? Well, great question. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 23. And we're going to look at three short passages that show us what happened to Jehoiakim. How did Israel end up in bondage? Knowing Deuteronomy 27 through 30, we could probably take a guess at what happened. But we'll look at scripture to see exactly what it was. 2 Kings chapter 23. And here's what happened, starting in verse 36. We'll read two verses here. This is what it says about Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebedah, the daughter of Padiah of Rumah. And he did what was what? Evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father's had done. Now look at 24, 1 through 4. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And verse 2 gives us a huge clue. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldeans and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the Ammonites and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by his servants, the prophets. Surely this came upon Judah at the command of the Lord to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he had done. So here, Jehoiakim, we see, did he choose to follow God? No. And what tends to happen is when a king goes bad, what happens to the people? The people go with it. And so Israel fell into the same sin, doing whatever was evil in their own eyes. And then God, not King Nebuchadnezzar, and so keep this in mind, these are the stories that when writers reference them, they want us to remember, God brought Jehoiakim into exile. God did this. It wasn't King Nebuchadnezzar working his plan. It was God working his plan that he promised to his people long ago. If you follow me, I'll bless you. If you don't follow me, I'll give you cursings. And that includes exile. Then look at uh, 2 Chronicles 36. And we're going to look at this because it's important for us to remember in just a moment when we get to the next couple verses in Daniel. 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and verses 5 through 8. So we get another picture here. Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and bound him in chains to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried part of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his palace in Babylon. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and the abominations that he did and what was found against him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, and Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his place. So Jehoiakim has refused to follow Torah, the law. His people have refused to follow Torah, his law, and God has exiled him here. But we see that it is God working behind the scenes. And so a big thing in Daniel that you're going to see over and over and over again is that God is the one orchestrating all the events. And the authors give us so many details that this is what is happening. Look at verse 2 of chapter 1 of Daniel. It starts off, and what's, and the what? What's the next few words? And the Lord what? Gave, okay? Three times in chapter 1, you're going to see where this, here it says Lord gave in verse 2. Then in verse 9, you're going to see again where the writer says God gave. Then in verse 17, you're going to see that God gave. Because the writer wants us to pick up on here that the kingdom of God is ultimately in control. The kingdom of man is never in control. They think they are. It looks like they are. But in God's world, in God's plan, and how he's working, he's the mastermind of all. All of this and his will will be done on earth as in heaven and no king or kingdom could ever thwart or stop what God is doing. So Daniel wants us to see, look, God is doing this in your life. God is working because here's what happens in exile. Here's what happens to us as people. When troubled times come our way, where do we think God is? Not caring about us, 
not want anything to do with us. God has abandoned us. God is distant. God has, how many times have you heard people say, God's not working in my life. It's what exile does to us. It causes us to forget. And Daniel's like, look, you're in exile. You're suffering, but your God hasn't forgot. He's working. He's orchestrated all of this for one purpose, which is Deuteronomy 30, where you return and you give your love back to him. You give your worship to him so he can be your God. You will be his people, and he will give you his blessings and return you to the land. This is the gospel going forth into the world. Then we see that King Nebuchadnezzar brought some of the vessels of the house of God. And this is what we just read in 2 Chronicles 36. And he brings them in, and these vessels were set apart. They were dedicated for the holy things of God in the temple. They were there for worship of God. They were there for the holy rituals of God, for the sacrifices of God. And these were set apart, dedicated, consecrated to the living God, to Yahweh, to him. And King Nebuchadnezzar takes them and brings them into his palace and into his temple. Why? Why does he do that? Well, in the ancient Near East, when you conquered a nation, that means you also conquered their God. So to keep the people under your thumb, you take the vessels of their God from their temple, you put them in your temple, so it becomes a daily reminder that the nation that has conquered you is in control. They dominate you. Not only do they dominate you, but they dominate your God. And so King Nebuchadnezzar brings these vessels to show the Jewish people, look, we've conquered you and we've conquered your God. Look at your vessels sitting in my house. Now, how many of you remember a story of another nation taking something that belonged to God and something terrible happened to them? Anybody know? Philistines with the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that story? 1 Samuel chapter 5, 1 through 5, you could write it down. Okay, they capture the Ark of the Covenant, place it in their temple, and there is a statue of their god, Dagon. They put it in the room with this big statue of Dagon. The next day they come in and the statue was knocked down. They're like, what in the world? They stand the statue back up. The next night happens, they come back, the statue's fallen down, and it's broken into pieces. Then God strikes the people of the Philistines with these sicknesses. And all of a sudden, they're like, get this ark out of here. We have taken something that doesn't belong to us. Like this, your God is doing crazy things to us. Get it out. Take it. We should have never taken this thing to begin with. So when we come to King Nebuchadnezzar taking the vessels, it should be a reminder of that story in 1 Samuel chapter 5 for us to pick up on and say, "Uh uh-oh, this isn't going to end well. For King Nebuchadnezzar because we've seen this before when somebody else has done this and has mocked the one true God God shows up and vindicates himself declares his name holy and declares his glory back from these kings and so we are to see this as a reminder like hey King Nebuchadnezzar is not going to get away with this that God's going to do something about this act of desecrating his vessels and then we see in chapter in verse 2 where it says that King Nebuchadnezzar brought those vessels to the land of Shinar. Does anybody know, this is a pop quiz question, does anybody know where the land of Shinar is or what story relates to that? Has anybody always seen that word anywhere else? When I was studying this, I came across that word and I saw like, there's like little letters in my study Bible that were like, hey, look at this in the middle of your page and it shows you a different reference. And so as I was studying this while I was on vacation, I looked it up. It's Genesis chapter 11. You guys ever heard of the story of the Tower of Babel? Okay. They went to Shinar in the Tower of Babel, and they said, let us, uh, 11.4 says this, let us make a name for ourselves. And that's significant, because in the ancient Near East, who is it that names things in the ancient Near East? You know who does? Kings. Kings name things. Think of creation. God creates Adam and Eve, creates Adam first, and what does he give Adam? Gives him a name. Adam, which means mankind in Hebrew. And then he tells Adam, I'm going to bring animals before you, and what is he going to do to these animals? Name them. 
So God gives Adam a kingly responsibility, a kingly role to rule over his creation under God's kingly divine authority. And so here you have God demonstrating that kings name things. And in this world, when the people say, I'm going to make a name for myself, what the people at the Tower of Babel were saying is, I'm the king of the universe. I'm making a name for myself. God, you can't tell me what to do. I'm king. I'm greater. And we're going to make a name for ourselves. And they put themselves in the place of God's authority and God's kingship. And what does God, the Ancient of Days, do? He shuts that down, right? He says, okay, if I don't put an end to this, they're going to think they're going to be able to achieve all this stuff in the world all on their own. I'm not going to have it. So he confuses the languages. He humbles them because of their pride. So when we see, takes the vessels to the land of Shinar, what should we think is going to happen to King Nebuchadnezzar? Here's a king making a name for himself, and we should be reminded that God doesn't allow that. God's not going to allow him to make a name for himself. God's going to show up just like he did in the Tower of Babel, and God's going to humble this king, and God's going to do something to him so that he knows God in heaven is the true king, not this man, not King Nebuchadnezzar. Y'all with me on that? And so this is an echo of Genesis chapter 11 that we are to keep in mind to help us understand what's happening here. So Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Uh, 3 says this, Then the king commanded Aspenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family, and the word for royal family means the seed of the kingdom. And that's a reference back to Genesis 3.15. But the, the line of Judah was told by God, was promised to David that on your throne... David, your kingdom will be established forever. One's going to come, and when he comes, he will rule on that throne forever. So whoever comes through the line of Judah was part of the promised seed of the kingdom. So here you have Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and and Abednego, and guess what? They are of the line of Judah. They are this royal family. They're of the seed of the kingdom. This is God's line who we promised to bring the Messiah through are now going straight into Babylon, straight into exile, but not only that, they're going into the king's court. So talk about living in the face of a culture drastically different from your own. One where they worship false gods and you worship the true God. Can you imagine being thrust into that scenario where now you're having to live before this king and you know your own faith, you know where your faith is grounded in, and you know they believe differently? And how do you respond And so just like kings do, where kings give names, right? What's the first thing that King Nebuchadnezzar does when he brings them into his palace? He names them. I'm in charge. I'm giving you new names. Now, do Daniel and his friends care? No, because they know that that superficial name doesn't compromise their faith. It doesn't compromise their worship. So fine, call me whatever you want. If somebody comes in and says, Brad, your new name is Fatso, okay, whatever. It doesn't define who I am. My faith is in God. It's not in your name. And so here, they don't compromise. They say, hey, it's not a compromise for us. Call us whatever you want. Well, you have Daniel, whose name in Hebrew means God judges, and he's given Belteshazzar. And Belteshazzar, that means protect the life of the king. And when you know the book of Daniel, what does he do? He, part of his role is to protect the life of the king. Then you have Hananiah, which means in Hebrew, Yahweh is gracious. And that's changed to Shadrach, which it's kind of a weird construction, but it literally means it's a god. It supposedly means their Babylonian god Marduk. It's a reference to one of their false gods. Then you got Mishael, which means who is like God, and his name is changed to Meshach, which again is another loosely name that is tied to a Babylonian god. And then we get to Azariah, where Yahweh has helped, and that's changed to Abednego, and that is a servant of the god, Babylonian god, Nebo. And so what's interesting about the makeup of this book is the people that are going to be reading this, the Hebrews, they wouldn't really understand the Aramaic names at the time, but they would understand the Hebrew names at the time and understand that, hey, understand who these people are and know that they're faithful people of God and God is going to be faithful to them. And so Daniel and his friends had to answer this all-important question, and we have to do it too in our own world. How do we navigate living in a foreign kingdom? How do we navigate living in a foreign kingdom? And 
what you see in the book of Daniel, and what we're going to see in just a moment, is they lived under that kingdom, even in exile, even in a place that was completely opposed to their God, Yahweh. They lived in it with hard work. They lived in it with excellence. And here's the hardest part of all. They had to pick and choose which parts of a society to adopt and which ones to say, I can adopt these things and be okay and not compromise. But these things, I will never compromise in. So it's the same as for us today. We don't reject all of society. There are things that we can choose to adapt and adopt that don't compromise our faith. But the important key is when there's a part of that society that is trying to get us to compromise, we should never compromise that part of our faith. We should hold to that faith, not knowing how it's going to play out and not knowing what God will do, whether he will rescue us or he won't rescue us. And it brings us to, I alluded earlier about keeping in mind the Jewish mindset. And the Jewish mindset had this worldview, this thought about monotheism. Monotheism is a belief in one God. And their idea was this, that there is truths out there in the world, even in a Babylonian culture that was completely opposed to God, there are things that they believed and things they taught in their culture that were true. Like, do we not see that in other places? There are things that, the sun rises in, well, I just lost, my, what is it, in the east, right? Their culture can teach, hey, the sun rises in the east. Yep, that's true. And what they believed is, look, there can be wisdom in other cultures and other religions, but here's the reality. All the truths that they might hit upon are all God's truths. And God's truths are always better. And you can actually see God work better if you know the living and the true God. And so this is the a mindset that they had is, look, even in this culture, there's, some, there's a lot of things they teach that are wrong. But anything that they do teach that is true, it's not their truths. It belongs to God. So this helped them to be able to adapt to the things that they saw as true in a society and say, hey, they didn't come up with that. That's God that gave it to them. And you know what? I can live better in life because I actually know the truth, God, and I can see that all truths is his truths. And so it's kind of, I'll give you an example of this. When I was in college, I had to read this book called, uh, it was written by, it was a, basically it was arguments by Plato and Socrates and he would argue with different people. One of the things that Plato believed, that Socrates believed, is that there, the world consisted in forms. If there's a chair here on earth, then there's a perfect chair somewhere. If there's a tree here that we see in our eyes, there's a perfect tree up here. And he said this, that if there's a man on the earth, then that means there's a perfect man somewhere. Now, even though his forms are completely false, is there not a perfect man that has lived in the world? Yes, Jesus Christ. So there's truth there but it didn't belong to Socrates. It's God's truth, and he didn't know what he was talking about, but we do because we know God's truth, and his truth is best, and his way is better, and if we know Christ, we know that that life is better than living without him. And so this is the Jewish mindset of their monotheism is, hey, we can live in a culture that's dominated by falsehood, but we also know whenever they do speak a truth, it actually belongs to our God, the one, the ancient of days. And so look at verse um, 8 through 21. We won't read them. You can read them later. And I promise to be done in just a few minutes. So if you need to leave, you can go ahead and leave. I will be perfectly okay with that. So we see that um, Daniel and his group, they, in verse 8, it says, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who were of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And then we see, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill and all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And so 
it leads us to a question. Why did Daniel and his friends not eat the king's food? And there's a couple theories, okay? Not a couple theories. There's a couple truths that are here. First is this. In the Jewish law, there were dietary restrictions. They weren't allowed to eat these foods. They needed to be distinct. They needed to be set apart from the rest of the world. And God said these are not things that you should eat. The second truth that could be a part of this is that a lot of the food that was given towards them from in, a, in, a, in the Babylonian culture, a lot of times the food, the meat, would be offered to idols, to false gods. And so the Jewish people did not want to defile themselves by eating food that was offered to a false god. So does the writer tell us exactly why Daniel refused the food? Does he tell us? No. We can speculate. We can say, hey, there's these laws. This is how they have. It's probably true. Probably so. But we know what the writer wants us to see is Daniel remained faithful to God and his ways. And in this scenario said, I'm not eating that. My friends are not eating that because it would go against, I would compromise my faith and my beliefs. And we see that he didn't do that. Then they were found after testing that Daniel and his friends were all better than any of the other servants that were there. And they acted better. They just, the results were better. Wow, what, what caused all of this? And then it says in verse 17 that they were given all wisdom and all insight and literature and all these things. And in other words, the role that Daniel and his friends took on is one of like a professor where people would come with questions and seek answers and they would teach and they would have this wisdom that just, like when you sit in a professor's class and they just open their mouth and it's like, how do you have that much knowledge? And they don't have notes who just speak at the top of their head. This is the kind of learning that they had. And so people came to them with, an, with life's hard questions. And we see that Daniel had this insight into dreams, had insight into visions. And then King Nebuchadnezzar in verses 18 to 21, after three years of training, brings them into his court and he tests them, asks them all kinds of questions, puts them through, and it comes out that they were way better than any other people, any other magicians, any other enchanters. They were the best. And not only were they just the best, they were 10 times better than anybody else in the kingdom. And so I wrote the question here, why? Was it because of a vegetable diet? Was it because they were eating healthier, right? You've been following along, why? Why were they better than everybody else? They obeyed God and God's in control and he says, look, God gave them favor the end of the day, it was God's favor. And so some people say, oh, it was the diet and that made them healthier and they cut away the fat. (laughs) No, it has nothing to do with that. (laughs) Getting scientific, it's not scientific. The writer tells us God gave them favor in everything. And the point of the book is God is working in his people in exile. If you choose to hold on, if you choose to remain faithful, if you don't let go of him, God's favor will be upon you. And so Daniel and his friends were able to be 10 times better, not because of anything that they did, not because of anything they earned, not because of anything they deserved. It was God gave it to them because they kept their faith in God. They never let go of that. And so Daniel's career went from 605 B.C. all the way to 539 B.C. And so here's a big question. We can close with this and we'll be done. Um, I just want to ask a couple questions and if anybody feels free to answer them because I think it's helpful to dive into the text, but also figure out what it means for us today and how we can practically apply what happens to Daniel and his friends. So what happens when those who are loyal to the kingdom of God find themselves working for and with those who are loyal to the kingdoms of the world? I'll say it again. What happens when those who are loyal to the kingdom of God find themselves working for and with those who are loyal to the kingdoms of the world. Say that again. Yeah, God's people have been promoted, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It's a witness. Shine as a light. I mean, this is what Jesus says, that let your good works shine before men so that they may see, let, I'm sorry, let your sh- light shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so there is the idea of being the light. It's the idea of being a witness. It's the idea of being God elevates his people within that realm. And so we have a guy who comes to our church who um, just being faithful to God, building relationships with businessmen, that 
he has he, he recently was invited to get a bunch of people from the business world that are Christians to then go to the White House to pray. And so this is something where he just faithfully lived his life and God elevated to where the White House called him. Not anything he did, it was just living in this world, interacting with people, and God elevates his people so that he can accomplish his purposes and his plans in this world. And so here's the second question, and we'll end with this. And the book of Daniel starts with God's faithful people living in exile. What virtues, beliefs, and practices are needed in order to live faithfully in a hostile culture? So we live in a hostile culture, okay? And it's only getting more difficult to engage. So I'll give you an example. The transgender, the homosexual community, that there is, have you guys heard of how they, you're not allowed to refer to somebody based upon a pronoun they don't identify with? Okay, like you can offend somebody by saying, hey, give that pen to him. And if that person doesn't identify as a him, they will get offended and say, hey, you don't respect me and you don't value me. And so we live in a culture now where it's getting to the place where even taking things that we've taken for granted for so many years, we now have to say, how do we engage this culture where we don't compromise our beliefs, but how can we engage this culture? So what virtues are necessary, what beliefs are necessary, and what practices are necessary for us while we live in a hostile culture that you know, one day we could be persecuted in this country if things, if God's cursing comes upon this country. So what beliefs are necessary? What virtues? What practices? Resolve, Resolve yeah. So how do we, how do we get that resolve? Where is that grounded in? Yeah, yep. Trusting in God for sure. What other thoughts do you guys have? What virtues, beliefs, or practices? Yeah. Love, faith. Those are good. And yeah, courage, for sure. Um, there was, yes, 100%. You have to be in the word because the word is where we see, we're reminded Remember Pastor Fidel a couple weeks ago talked about don't forget to be thankful. Like, don't forget, I mean, no, don't be forgetful. Uh, the whole idea of don't forget what God has done for you. And the word of God reminds us of that. But also I think too, reading scripture, Jesus gave us a great tool of navigating in a hostile culture. And when you see Jesus act with people and when he interacted with them, you know, people are freaking out. Do we pay this, tax to this? Do we pay tax to that? And he just like, give to God what's God's. Give to Caesar's what's Caesar's. But that's not what life is about. Life is not about what politics deserve. Life is not about what this people over here deserve. Life is about one thing, coming to serve, coming to love, coming to give forgiveness, coming to give grace, coming to give mercy. And somebody uh, said a few months ago, um, Yvette Garcia, I don't know if you guys know her, but she's pointed out a great thing about Jesus is that whenever Jesus engaged the culture, even if it was in a different scenario, he responded with grace and he responded with truth. And I think that's the same way for us to navigate life in a hostile culture is we give grace, as much grace as possible, but when we're asked about what we believe, we give truth. And she gave the example, which I think is a great example, is the woman that was caught in adultery and Jesus is there, all the accusers are there, and he causes the accusers to leave because all of them sin, and they realize, I can't throw a stone, I sin, I'm out. And then he looks at her, and he said, woman, where are your accusers? And she's like, I don't see them. And he says, well, I don't accuse you either, but go and sin no more. So he offered her the grace, but then he offered her the truth. And I think as we look at the life of Jesus, as we engage in the word, as David said, that this keeps us grounded in, here's how we should be acting as a people of God. And when you look at Daniel and the response they give, it wasn't a response of, well, my God's better than your God, and blah, 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 blah. It was, look, we're going to worship our God. And if you're going to throw us in a furnace, 
so be it. God can deliver us, but if he doesn't, oh well, we're still not going to bow down to your gods because we know what's true to be true, and we're never going to compromise. And so I think all those things you guys said are important because we live hostile cultures. You might live in a hostile workplace. or not live in a hostile workplace. You might work in a hostile workplace. Or there might be things that you see pressures from society, and our younger generation is being pressured more now than ever before just because technology is better, and it's in their face more. I mean, you have kids that are looking at pornography as young as eight and nine years old. Like, that's when it starts. And so the pressures of society, is there anything wrong with this? Is there anything wrong with identifying as not what I am biologically? Is there anything wrong with, you know, just living life for myself? Like, the, our culture is being immersed with so much pressure to abandon God where it's getting harder and harder for Christians to say, this is what I believe because of the outrage, because of people that will say, well, I'm offended by what you're saying. And it's like, I, you might be offended. We don't mean to offend you, but truth is truth, whether your feelings like it or not. And so truths don't have feelings and don't care about our feelings. They're true because God has established them. And to live in this hostile culture, it takes resolve, like you said, takes being in God's word, ta definitely takes love, definitely takes mercy. Because as we love others, as they loved us, because people that are in that culture, at the end of the day, King Nebuchadnezzar was lost. He didn't know any better at the end of the day. And God had to humble him, and God opened his eyes to see, you are the living God, the God of Daniel. You are the true king. And so we live in this culture where people are going to be hostile, but they don't know any better. And this is what Jesus understood. This is why he said, Father, forgive them. Why? They don't know what they're doing. They're lost. They're broken, just like we were at one point. So I take enough of your time. I'm going to end there. And so um, I'll say this at the beginning. We're probably not going to be able to get all the way through Daniel chapter 12 because we only have four weeks and only about an hour to do it. So at another time during the year, we'll do a Daniel part two, but we're going to try to get all the way through chapter seven, and then we'll leave eight through 12, the very confusing apocalyptic part for the second time, and then we'll all be confused after that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but let me pray for you guys. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we've had, and Father, we just thank you that you are a God who is always at work, and you are always faithful to keep your promises, Father God, and we just see that even though your people go to the exile through their own sinful choices, that, Father, you are always ready and willing to lead them out of that exile, to lead them through resurrection, so once again they could be your people, you could be our God. And, Father, we thank you that you've shown us the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, that you've opened our eyes to see our need for him. And, Father, amazing for us to be your children, to be made in your image, and to carry on the same mission that you took on to seek and save the lost. So pray for each person in here. Continue to provide for them. Continue to guide them, Father God, and lead them into your truths. And Father, I pray that you give us the courage to go out and to stand up for your truth, not compromise, but also engage this world in a way that we show them love, faith, grace, so they can know you as well. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for coming out. We'll meet again next Wednesday. And if you have any questions, you can stay behind and ask me questions. I don't have all the answers, so if you want any questions, you can definitely ask.